Like everything changing from paper to electronic form, insurance buying and selling has also turned majorly into electronic form. All you need now is just to log in on a website, compare policies and just buy the right policy for you on the click of a mouse button. So today we will talk all about policy buying, or how online buying is better than offline and what are the ways in which we can really go and buy the policies and joining us will be uh, the biggest person currently in the policy space. We'll be joined by Yashish Dahiya, uh, CEO and co-promoter of PolicyBazaar.com, one of the successful ventures as far as online policy buying is concerned. Welcome to uh, the studios, Yashish. Uh, first of all, uh, you have started a great venture here. Uh, we would like to ask you, first of all, uh, about for the viewers, uh, what are the right ways to buy a policy? So uh, I think the best way to buy a policy is to first know why you are buying a policy. And uh, so the first conversation you have to have with yourself or with anybody is, why am I buying this particular policy? Is there a health insurance requirement? Is there a life insurance requirement? Is there a car insurance I'm buying this for? And once you've understood that requirement, you go through, okay, so then what's the best option for me? Uh, if you're buying a health insurance, there are about 23 companies providing health insurance plans today. There are roughly about 130 insurance plans available. You don't need to go through all of them, but you at least need to know the top seven, eight, and uh, then buy what you think is right for yourself, for your own specific needs, because everybody is unique. Similarly, it goes for life insurance. So I would say that's the way to do it. You identify your need first, or you speak to somebody who can help you identify your need. Then you identify the number of policies there. You find out which one is about the best for you. You don't need to buy the absolute best, mm. but at least it should be amongst the top two, three plans for you. And once you are within that, there's not much of a difference. So then you can buy one which is most suited to you. And also you've brought in a major change in the way people buy policies, at least in India. The online policy bizarre platform, which you have, has changed a lot of things. But uh, again, I would like to ask you how online is buying policy is different from on, uh, offline. And will the discounts be better uh, as far as premium is concerned? So see, there are some products where prices are lower online. But I don't think you should buy insurance only on price. Right? Uh, I think the biggest difference that the last eight years, uh, we and the online buying industry has been able to bring about is that people at least know why they are buying a policy. I remember in 2008, we did an interview of about 100 people who had bought an insurance policy. They could say how much premium they are pay paying, but they could not say what is the benefit they are getting. They did not have any idea of what is the life insurance cover that they had. They just knew I'm paying 15,000 rupees every year, I'm paying 25,000 rupees every year. They had been sold that product by somebody who said you give 25,000 rupees per year, you will get some return. And lo and behold, the fact was that 70, 75% of all people, that is by the way, one crore people every year were canceling their policies prematurely. So lapsation was a big problem in the industry. And the customer has to realize the customer loses money. When he cancels a policy before lock-in, he loses about half of his money. So eventually that is not happening online. Online has very high persistency rates. Persistency basically means once you buy a policy, you stay with it. Why does that happen? That happens because you know what you're buying. If you know what you're buying, you ask an online person, what have you got? He will not tell you, I paid, I buy a policy for 13,000 rupees. He will tell you, I have a one crore life cover or I have a seven lakh rupee health cover. He's not going to tell you, I pay 15,000 rupees, I don't know why I pay, I don't know what I will get. That is not the way to buy things. So I think online and offline are extremely different uh, uh, from that perspective. But yes, I would like to say in certain products, especially life insurance, uh, the prices are lower online. Also, we are trying the same thing in health insurance because what we've also found is that fraud is much less online. Mm -hmm. So the claims ratios are much lower. And what that means is companies can bring out special products for the online industry which they cannot afford to sell offline because the fraud element is way too high. And this is data which we are seeing from all insurance companies that the claim ratios in health insurance, the claims ratio online is less than 30%. The claims ratio offline is 85-90% because of obvious reasons. People who are already sick are somehow managing to buy policies offline because somebody is helping them do that. 
But uh, that's not the idea, right? You're supposed to buy insurance for an unforeseen event mm -hmm. or for an event that may happen, not for an event that will happen. You can't buy health insurance once you know you are sick. You can't buy car insurance after having the accident. You have to buy it before. So I think uh, online has got lower fraud. It's got uh, uh, more buy-in from the consumer, more understanding from the consumer. And yes, in certain products, lower prices. So prices are fairly competitive. And tell us about your journey. That has also been quite exciting. We have heard that you were in US, then you came to India and started this venture. So tell us a bit about your journey, the problems you faced and are still facing. So uh, when we started uh, Policy Bazaar, I think the biggest problem we faced was that nobody believed the customer will get up and buy products. Because what they had seen was that uh, customers uh, would not buy products on their own. They would have an agent come to them, meet them multiple times, convince them to buy a product, and then maybe, just maybe, a customer might buy a product. So there was a lot of inertia. And the customer did not know what he was buying. So there was a lot of debate about will the customer ever engage. And if you think about it, what is the biggest thing we have done over the last three, four years, we have tried to explain to the consumer which products are good for him, which products are not good for him. And that engagement has come. Today, there are, uh, you know, of course, we all, we all know the numbers. There are roughly about uh, 100,000 people coming and inquiring every day and about six to 7,000 people buying a policy every day. Now, that's a very, very large number. And uh, these numbers uh, are obviously picking up by more than 100% every year. I think the initial part was very difficult because nobody understood why this industry would happen. Uh, but now it's established. And you come from a, you know, a developed economy background yeah. in India. Uh, how do you see the potential is huge over there? But do you think that the kind of people, the people's awareness, that is also a big challenge? See, in the US, you have uh, class action lawsuits. So if you sell a product, if you sell me a product which is not optimal for me, which is not right for me, I can do a case against you. I can get a lawyer to do a case against you. And all the people who've been affected by those policies can do a case against you. In India, class action suits are not possible. So companies get away with selling very bad products to consumers, and so mm -hmm. do distributors. Uh, so it's a very difficult environment. And what that has led to is, is a proliferation of mis-selling. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, that is exactly why the policy bizarre opportunity becomes very, very pop, like, you know, uh, substantial in a market like India versus a market like the US or a market like, uh, you know, uh, the UK, where transparency is a lot higher, mm -hmm. I would say. And uh, as I said, lawsuits are very strong. The legal, uh, you know, uh, mechanism is very strong. And what that implies is, if I do something wrong to you, even 10 years later, there will be a very, very strong repercussion. But the repercussion will happen. In India, the repercussion is not really there. Mm -hmm. For all the missold policies, who has paid? Nobody's responsible. Nobody's responsible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, not, neither is the government responsible, nor are the companies responsible. The customers have lost money, retired people have lost money. But nobody's responsible. And uh, I think that doesn't exist Just. in the US or the UK. People are made accountable. Mm -hmm. And that, that is the problem here. Yeah, that's exactly why transparency is far more required here than there. All right. And Yashish, uh, you know, the complaints what mostly most of the Indians have is that when they go to buy policy, there are thousands of scores of people who are ready to sell them. But when it comes to claim settlement, uh, their real concerns are not addressed. What about the claim settlement process over here? I have now run Policy Bazaar for 10 years. Mm -hmm. In the online world, I can say I have not come across a single case. I should have come across at least a single case where a customer's complaint has been without reason rejected. There is a 96% settlement within four hours, cashless, in the health insurance industry. Life insurance now has a rule that after three years, on no grounds, can the claim be rejected. All these laws are there. The claims uh, are being paid. If the claims were not being paid, how do these claims ratios come about? You know, uh, the, the, so, so I think things have changed quite a bit. I wouldn't say things have changed. The point is, claims were being paid. There is a fraud element, and if, if there are frauds, so if I already have cancer, I don't declare, I buy a health insurance policy, I go in, have the health insurance and medical, then I submit the medical bills, the people say, hey, you already had cancer, you did not declare, obviously I will not get the claim.
So you mean to say that a big part is that first, a lot of fraudulent things happen, and second, the awareness is also not there to the people that they need to declare it. Because people new need to declare. And I think that is the biggest reason why claim settlement is much higher online, primarily because you've got a higher de self declaration. So people are filling up the form. What happens when you buy a policy offline? Somebody comes to you, says, with some pencil marks. The truth of the matter is, there's some pencil marks, sign here, sign here, sign here. I will fill the rest of the form for you. Mm -hmm. That doesn't happen online. You mm -hmm. fill the form yourself. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. And also, uh, we are hearing that technology is changing very, very many things over there in policy world as well. A new claim settlement process has come where if you uh, record a video through your mobile and put it on you know, website or mail it to the, the policy uh, giver, you will settle a claim. So how technology is sh reshaping the overall things? See, uh, technology basically, w what is this video doing, right? The video is basically, he's got a timestamp. It knows that th the event happened now and it knows, it, it reduces the need for a surveyor to come to you and assess the damage. Because you can do that yourself. You know, as long as you are guided, it's a, it's a guided video, which helps you look at the points and say, I have seen this, this, this. And if the underwriter is satisfied, he will clear your claim. So it reduces the need for a person to come there. Mm -hmm. And because it reduces the need for a person to come there, it reduces the time. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to wait for half a day for the person to come there, go back. This is happening on a lot of fronts. So I think technology in insurance is still not what you would call cutting edge technology. Mm -hmm. What we are using is technology which was available five years ago, but just using it for purpose for our industry. And I think uh, in our industry, one of the big pieces was somebody had to be there to see the damage. Somebody has to be there to assess if a car can be insured, if a person can be insured. And all of that can be done through videos, as long as they've got a timestamp and as long as they're tamper-proof. So that's, that's precisely what's being put in place. So whenever we go to buy a policy, the biggest thing is premium. So how the premium is decided and you know how should a customer uh, pay a premium? Should he go towards less premium uh, and less coverage, more premium, more coverage. What is your assessment over there? See, what should uh, my take is the premiums do vary. That is the second point. The first point is you should know what you want to get covered. If you know you want a 5 lakh rupee health insurance policy and you know I don't want room rent cappings, etc. I don't want X, Y, Z. Once you've got those parameters covered, then you say, okay, which all companies have these parameters covered? What are the prices of all of them? And then you can pretty much go for any one of them. And maybe if two are very close in price, you can ask somebody who is quicker in claim settlement. It won't be claim settlement ratio. Everybody's settling claims, but some may be very proactive in doing it, right? So you can have a view on that. So after that, you just buy your policy. It's that straightforward. But I think one shouldn't put the premium before, uh, if you realize that you come up with a situation where you can't afford that kind of policy, then you re-understand what you want to get covered. It's not a very long activity. It takes about half an hour to two hours at most, and uh, it should cover a health insurance process. In a motor insurance, it's, it's probably five, ten minutes. You go there, you know what you want to get covered. You want engine protector, you want X, you want Y. Whatever you want, what are the prices? You buy the product that you're comfortable with. You want government, you want private. You buy whichever one you you know suits you best because some people like to deal with the government, some people like to deal with private companies. It's it's up to them. So this technology, when you know uh, we can, uh, you think this technology will help better when we go forward in uh, settling claims, settling uh, paying premiums, or recording the uh, proof that you were not well, or in case of cars uh, that your car has accident has happened. So how seriously do you take these videos and all that? So see what we are doing. Uh, the technology is not just limited to that. What we are doing is we're trying to bring a uniform experience across the industry. Mm -hmm. So if you notice what we've already started doing, we've tied up with a pre-policy medical company. They do pre-policy medicals for all companies now. So when you come to us, you need to get a medical done, right? So far what used to happen, you used to go to a company, the company would do the medical for you. What we are doing is we've tied up with one uh, medical doing organization in the simplest form, and they are doing the medicals for all companies. So what that does is gives the comp people the ability to see what's happening, you know, what their medical reports are, etc. On the claim side, we're doing the same. We're tying up with one TPA to provide uh, service to all our policies sold across companies. Now, what does that do? Guess a uniform customer experience. The policies are known. It's available on your app. What is covered? What's not covered? As long as it's covered, the TPA is clearing it, and we are in touch with the TPA all the time. You know, is it right? Of course, we are not licensed to do the claim settlement. But the TPA is, and we've just tied up with a single TPA 
to provide this across the organization. And all organizations say, it's fine. You can do it via the TPA because we trust this TPA. We also use this TPA for most of our policies, and that's fine. Okay, and let's talk about something which is different from this, is the startup sector. You have been a successful startup over here in India after coming from US, you started you, your company. Uh, so how do you assess the overall startup environment? Do you think the government's efforts are really bearing the fruit now? I think, uh, uh, the, how, how do I say this? I think the less the government is involved, mm -hmm. uh, it's better for the startup community. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll mention why. See, the government is at the opposite end mm -hmm. of a startup community. Who becomes a startup? Mm -hmm. Somebody who does not get a salary. Mm -hmm. Somebody who does not have any safety, no job safety. Uh, this person starts something because he has a great idea, he thinks it will work. They take a certain amount of risk. Who joins the government? Mostly, I'm not talking about politicians, but I'm talking about most of the government services. Somebody who wants safety, somebody who wants a fixed salary, somebody who wants a pension, somebody who wants to do great things for the country, but in a very structured environment. They're the opposite end of the spectrum. If you ask this person to start making decisions for this person, it is not going to lead to good results. My view is somebody's friend, somebody's you know, relative is going to get the money who will not have the capability to do this. I think that's just going to be wrong. Uh, when the venture industry invests, when it decides which company to invest in, it's a very complex decision. It depends on a lot of factors. For a government to do that, it's, it's not a form. Mm -hmm. It's not a form that you fill up a form and we will decide A or B based on certain computer-based heuristic, right? However, so my view is uh, the government would be better off partnering with the venture industry and let the venture industry make the decisions and the government be at the back of it, make it, make it supportive. A bit like the Chinese government does, right? They, they support the activities of the venture environment, but they don't go and make the investments themselves. Because if you make the investments yourself, nepotism will come in. Please, mm -hmm. like, you know, you're going to give somebody $5 million mm -hmm. or even $500,000, right? Why, sh why should a government official just give it to Yashish Dahiya, who's n not a relative of any government official? He will obviously find a reason why his nephew or niece is the smartest of the, of the lot. So I think the government should not make investments themselves. Uh, they should stay in the background. Where the government should help is really creating uh, situations like a sandbag environment. See, we've, we come in contact as startups very quickly with regulations. Mm -hmm. And regulations don't always understand us because we're trying to change the status quo. Mm -hmm. For the right, most startups have a good intent. They don't have an intent to do harm. They have a good intent. They're not frauds, right? They're trying to make, make changes. But it usually does not fit the regulatory framework. So creating a sandbox environment where a startup can operate, that is where the government should come in.